mother bought me SimCity 4 when I was around 10 years old. It was one of my first video games. I fell in love with it, although I was really bad at it at first. It took me a while to understand why a neighborhood with no schools meant bad health, more fires, and more crime. And did you know that when you plop a bus stop on the street, there's a wave of happiness increase from all surrounding residences? Why are these people happy taking the bus when my city has no car congestion at all? Wouldn't it be more efficient to drive? I was immediately intrigued by the mechanics of the game, and I sought to discover how realistic SimCity was. Well, it turns out people feel happier during 30 minute long commutes when they are biking, taking the metro, or walking. But aside from the pleasure induced by silently standing in a metro wagon, places with more public transit are cleaner and greener, and green cityscapes make people feel happier than slabs of asphalt. But that seems a bit obvious, let's look at something more in depth. In SimCity, if you want to make your city pretty and posh, you can add some parks to increase housing value. It's similar in real life, because when you have a higher housing value, rich people will move in and they'll be, be, build bigger houses, and they'll be pretty happy because there are parks. But high-income households also like to own cars, and so there's, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of traffic between your rich neighborhood and your crowded downtown, and that area will see a decrease in housing value. So who moves there? Well, the low-income people. And they won't be very happy because there's a lot of noise and a lot of pollution. So. Now we're looking at two scenarios. First of all, how more public transit mean less cars and mean more happiness and a cleaner city. But also, secondly, how more parks can attract cars and create traffic and social division. So these kind of have the sim similar variables in place, so cars, parks, traffic, and so on, but they're seemingly run against each other. And we we know from that at least that all these variables are connected so i feel like from what i see here i discovered that all of the variables inside of a city are kind of connected they affect each other but they're also really complicated so i thought to myself what if we could create a simulation that models real life cities and all of its variables and that way we can use it to improve the way we live and the way we treat our planet and our economy so I'm going to talk about how we can do that, why we can do that, what are some challenges that come with it, of course, and some of the solutions that could be possible. So by now you're thinking, well, Ricky, you're heading to the clouds. And that's partially true. But universities like MIT are already starting to sort of discover these relationships within a city, these variable relationships in certain corners of different cities and try to map them out and predict human behavior and city behavior. And all we need to do is multiply that a thousand times and create a bigger simulation that could be for an entire city. So how exactly can we do that and why do I know that's possible? Well, think about it this way. Let's, here's an example. If you have a highway construction project and there's a McDonald's next to that highway, somewhere around, you know, like those gas station areas. And that new highway is going to increase the max load capacity by a certain number of cars. So more cars will be able to go on that highway. And you can use that information and link it to the McDonald's and try to predict the financial situation of the McDonald's in the next five months, for example, after the highway has been built. Well, it's a bit of the same thing with a simulation. You're trying to connect different variables and looking at the relationship and trying to predict some of the behaviors, trying to simulate some change. All we need to do is figure that out for different pairs of variables inside of a city. So let's say you found the financial situation of the McDonald's. You can look at how that comes into play, how that affects the financial situation of the Wendy's or of the Walmart next to it. And, that'll, and once you have that, you just keep expanding all your relationships until you form a big spider web for an entire city which we can call a simulation. But that sounds a bit tedious, and it certainly sounds harder than I make it seem. So why would we need to do this? Well, simply said, there is a professor. His name is Eric Miller. He works at the University of Toronto, and he works on a simulation project in the field of transportation, which aims to provide policymakers and investors with tools and insights for them to make better decisions. So he'll sort of give a give more perspective around why you should build, you should or should not build a metro station in this area based on 
everyone who lives around it, for example. And it allows policymakers and engineers to make better decisions, to be more informed about certain situations when they want to go on with a project. Another thing that's important to note is that city simulations shouldn't just be a one-size-fits-all model for a given city, but rather it should embrace, it should harness the complexity of a given city without any bias or reductionism. And the way we can do that is by creating avatars, kind of like the Sims, where which we are basing off of population data. So Sims avatars that we create based on population data that we put into our city simulation and kind of let them live and treat the simulation really like a SimCity game. And this allows us not only to map out population data, map out simulations, but also to avoid any privacy issues involved with data collection. So we don't have to like stalk at everyone's bedroom windows, which is cool. So here's an interesting example between a comparison between the average American city versus the average European city. Although the automotive industry is so much more potent in the US, we also notice an increase in air pollution per capita, more traffic, more commute, and more social segregation based on urban sprawl, so the capacity for the city to expand horizontally through suburb to suburbs. And that means there's sort of a decrease in the production capacity of a city, even though it uses the same amount of resources, the city is slightly less productive than it, should, than it could be. What I'm saying is, even though you may think that the American cities, the American society is very efficient, it uses a lot of resources, and a lot of times those resources aren't used at maximum profit. Let's take, for example, any city, any city with one or two hours of commute. People who live in those cities have one or two hours where they're just wasting gas and not doing anything particularly productive. When they, sh when they could be being at home, cooking, or working, or so on, and living their life. So American cities aren't necessarily at their maximum productivity. And that's something that we can't really see with our, sort of, with our system that we have right now. And it would be great to have a simulation to be able to really map these details out and try to prove things that are hard to prove. And another thing that's hard to, that's hard to prove and even more subtle is perhaps... Did you know that higher commute times equal higher divorce rates? Well, that's also something that's hard to prove, and that's also something that matters because it still affects a lot of people every day, but we don't weigh it into our decision-making. And with a simulation, we can grab all of these things together and allow policymakers, investors, engineers, and so on to just look at everything, every single factor that comes into play when making a decision, everything in one spot, instead of have, having to go all over the internet search for research papers, and so on. So now let's look at the European city. European cities have less cars, but also less parking spots. That could mean, like, that could mean a restraint on individual freedoms or individual capacity to succeed, kind of like, American, kind of like the American dream. That doesn't really happen. But it could also mean a tighter residential and commercial zoning within a city, and that's great for local businesses to succeed within a smaller range. They have more clientele. And all these things together kind of show us how a simulation could be useful for mapping out cities and looking at decisions in a way that we haven't really been looking at before, in a more optimized way, looking at everything that plays into a decision. And more so, we can discover solutions that could potentially help us raise the maximum cap of the American city like I told you. So we could figure out ways to really increase efficiency of a city without sacrificing resources and that way companies don't have to sacrifice their self-interest to protect the environment which is something that we've been working on for years another important thing to think about is how is how these simulations can map out policy shifts and political changes within a city within a country but also it can help companies like uber like airbnb to test out markets before they implement their features into a new city and, and taking that big risk. So let's talk about some of the challenges that come with such a thing, such a simulation. I'm going to name at least three of them, the three most important ones, I would say. So first of all, um, although data collection in this day and age is pretty advanced, we sort of see a lack of computational power still 
even though it is still on the rise. So for, for a notable example is, for example, Eric Miller from the University of Toronto, his simulations take days and sometimes weeks to run. But ultimately, this is not a problem that we really need active pursuing because Technologies, big word technologies like parallel computing, cloud cl clustered cloud computing, things that I can't really pronounce right now, are have seen light in recent years, something that we've never dreamed of having decades ago. And really computational power is on the rise. So that's so ultimately we hope to see these big city simulations take just hours to run. Secondly, and this is something that may be more relevant to you and that may be something that you've already been thinking about, is Let's go back to the American and European city example. Um, if, you, if you noticed, the American city and the European city have completely different histories, geopolitical contexts, and social situations. And that means so that their city background is completely unique. So, and you've probably been thinking about the solution too, but ultimately we would need a different simulation for every city to really capture the uniqueness of every city. Thirdly, I like to talk about how models are imperfect. So I was mentioning way earlier on that in the highway and McDonald example that we see links between them. And a lot of these city links can be facilitated using theories and equations that already exist in our fields like economics or sociology. But the thing with these models, so these big relationships that are already predefined for us, is that they are imperfect. And if you look at sociology, there's at least three ways to look at any issue. So what do we do with them, knowing that they're inaccurate, even the most um, advanced equations are inaccurate? Well, ultimately, a simulation isn't about building the perfect simulation of a city, but rather it is about improving it more and more and trying to figure out all the possibilities of generating different solutions based on different theories. So. I would see having more models, different models that are all sort of have slightly, have slight flaws. Different models actually have an advantage for simulations where simulations can generate more possibilities, more solutions for a given problem. And that's something that's, that's a challenge that actually benefits us. And another thing tied to sort of the imperfectness of simulations is how from one day to another, your political party might change in a city, or a natural disaster might ravage your city or province, and your, we fear our simulations becoming sort of obsolete. And in that case, we would need to always be updating our simulation to sort of follow the, the latest version of a city. And if our computational power is good enough, that shouldn't be something too tedious. So ultimately, we can see that sort of simulations are really complex and are a bit tedious to maintain. But, all, but the truth is, there's a lot of problems that we, can, we can't really solve without changing the way we see our cities, the way we observe our cities, and the way we interact with our cities. There's a lot of problems that we don't see, but that we all live in. And these simulations can help us better prepare to make better decisions for our cities and to sort of, like I said, raise the cap on the productivity of our cities without having to without having to waste more resources and hurt the environment. So with that, we can even find solutions that can benefit our economy and our society, make us more innovative without having to hurt the environment, which is a big plus. But a simulation shouldn't just be built, an urban planning simulation shouldn't just be built by urban planners and computer scientists, but rather it should be built through everyone, engineers, lawyers, doctors, sociologists, historians, politicians, management people, business people, and so on, to really create a ja jacks of all trades simulation. And that's something that could benefit all of us instead of people in certain fields. Rome wasn't built in a day, and the simulated version of one won't be built in one either.